I'm looking at just blocked on the phrase high, pro high, pro high productivity problems. Um, high performance computing. High perfor yes, that's what I'm looking for. High performance computing parallel and distributed. There is a course in architecture, software architecture. There is a practicum in actually programming, and you get to work with several different clusters and grids. No, we run no Windows. It's Linux and Solaris. You get Solaris on the Sun machines. You get Linux on the i86s. The i86s is a 24 core um, <coughs> cluster of quad core machines. The uh, Solaris machine is eight cores. And there is a grid of about 30 machines that can be a grid of about 30 Solaris machines that can also be, that's also available. That's something new over there. This is, go there's going to be a certificate program, which we're hoping will start in the fall, which will be about half a master's degree. The courses are at the, are at the graduate level, and the prerequisite is either a degree in CS or equivalent experience, <laughs> so you can get exempted by the uh, chair of the department. And the courses are applicable to a graduate degree if you choose to go on. So anybody who wants it, you've got to move because registration is going to close the end of the next week, which is the only reason I'm standing up in the middle of everything. What's that on the mailing list? Hey, I sent something to Jim. I've got copies of the piece I gave Jim for anybody who wants them. See me after the meeting. Okay. Uh, one more thing. Uh, the Deluge group will meet again in February. And they are? Uh, Deluge has a desktop Linux user group for end users. So we, 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 we particularly cater to end user use the way people like to use Windows. Well, let's we show people how to use Linux the same way. And actually, our topic was going to be KDE 4. So for those people who are this is on an end user level, come to the meeting. Yeah, here there's a desktop in there somewhere. <laughs> Freedom IT? Yes, Freedom <laughs> IT. Um, we're meeting in Lake Classic, uh, February 9th through 12th, and the topics we're going to be talking about is free software and multimedia. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I understand that it, it, it's not just a conference. Um, going I've been to involved in the too, right? Okay. That, that, uh, uh, they're going to Lake Classic for a reason, I believe. <laughs> we this is our third annual trip up there for conference. We're trying to turn it into a conference center for as an alternative to being here in the city. Yeah, you don't like the city. <laughs> Ruben tells the place. I know. I just want to let anyone else. Uh, but you have a, a, a general meeting coming up to you? Mm -hmm. mm, no, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think I've seen one this Ron, this is not my announcement, but the cards up there are from a recruiter who's looking for essays and essays of networking. So if anyone is uh, essay looking for placement, you got the cards up there. She couldn't stay. Mark, you actually I have an announcement just like that. Well, um, actually, um, um, I've, been, okay, I've been working with the class the past uh, three months. Plus, um, had been looking for some people, but I think right now we're uh, there's, there's no saturation point. So they may not be looking for anybody out. But however. If you do have a resume, you're interested in going to a web hosting company looking for a level one, level two techs, uh, or network administrators, or something like that, then give me your resume and I'll pass it along. Anyone else? My one is going twice. Okay. Um, I will uh, briefly mention that our next meeting is Wednesday, February 27th. Uh, I don't uh, often know what the topic is. We have uh, several mailing lists. Everyone should be on at least an analog announce. So you find out about this meeting and, and pretty much everything else that we do. Uh, now we'll talk is our technical discussion list. Uh, the Python workshop has its own list. And uh, we also have a very active uh, IRC channel over on Freeno. Um, on that note, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Greg Martin, who is going to show us the all new, I understand, KDE4. That's it. Thank you. So KDE is, of course, a giant uh, desktop environment. Uh, we have everything from the desktop itself to the office suite, um, the media player, you name it, it's part of KDE. Uh, I've done my best to learn all about it, but 
flexibility. It <laughs> uh, can run for more than a few minutes, as you're seeing right here this is the KDE 4 desktop. But uh, I wouldn't trust it to be mission critical stuff right now. There's still crashes and all kinds of great stuff that can go over the place. So it's definitely usable by a technical crowd. Um, we're looking for any bug reports you can give us, and that's the major reason why we decided to come out with this big four release right now. Uh, we had code that was just sitting there for almost two and a half years. 84 was being developed, and we just weren't seeing users uh, use it. We weren't getting any, any reports, that any bugs with it. We thought it was all great. We knew it wasn't, so uh, we needed to get it into a state where general, the general public could at least take a stab at it, tell us what doesn't work. So we we said we committed on a date. It was in October. That date did not stay as firm as we intended. I uh, moved it up to January, and that's where we placed. Uh, our libraries uh, were frozen solid for a couple months, and our just became very, very stable. Our libraries are a wonderful base to work on. Uh, it's the applications right now where you see a lot of the bugs. Um, Plasma is an example that I'll get to. Uh, next point here is it is much, much, much faster. Uh, <laughs> The application that I worked on in KDE, for instance, uh, it used to take uh, up to one or two seconds to run on a, uh, just to start up on a decently powered machine. Uh, this, the program was case is um, So I took a look at it with the help of another, he was an Englishman, he was John Capsule. Uh, he looked at the front end for case this guard, I looked at the back end. Um, we put in a whole bunch of Fixes. That was my first bug fix to KDE was to get um, the speed of our back end down from one second to point zero one second. So that was a start button. Much faster. With that application, but overall, the whole desktop is much faster. We pushed for that. Uh, we shifted over to Q4 as our toolkit. Um, Troll Tech, uh, the Norwegian developers, I think, they took care of a lot of uh, speed improvements. Plasma. I did mention Plasma. Plasma was Aaron Seigel's uh, brainchild. Uh, he had this great idea about ooh, four years ago now. Uh, he just wrote it on a napkin like all the great inventors do. It's so legend has it. Um, Plasma was going to be our new desktop environment. Uh, it had ideas like um, Apple, Apple uses Dashboard now. One of their new features. KDE had that as we were building towards that year ago, um, since well before that was going to be. What Plasma is about, Plasma is uh, think to desktop and think to test bar. Uh, that's essentially Plasma. Uh, on the desktop, we now support widgets. Before it was just on. Uh, before you would just see the files that were in your desktop folder. Now you can have things like a battery monitor, um, you can have the weather, the phase of the moon, RSS feeds, uh, picture of the day, you name it. It's up to developers to come up with these things. We've only provided a few samples. But we didn't know where it's at, really. <laughs> uh, we saw that with the Mac, and uh, one thing that's going to be nice is Plasma will, in the near, near the distant future, we'll be able to open up uh, widgets from Mac OS. So the ones that you see on your Mac will be able to open on a KDE desktop coming soon. That's because of uh, changes in our toolkit um, and how Apple has reused some of KDE's code. We've been working together with them uh, to provide a web browser, for instance. So with this sharing of code between the two, we can share other things too, such as Google. So we just get the data from data engines. There are things that developers write. Uh, that provide things like the battery information, um, any anything at all, uh, the usage of your disk, these sorts of things, and it's done in an intelligent way uh, relative to just the naive approach. Uh, the naive approach that most people take is my widget looks for the battery usage, so I'm going to look up the battery usage from the kernel on my own, and I'll fire up a timer to get that. And 
when the timers fires are up, they ignite widgets. Now, on a typical desktop, you'll have uh, five or so widgets, and each of those is going to have their own timer. Now, for anyone who has used PowerTop on Linux, they're familiar with timers. Timers are what eat your battery. They are a timer is an interrupt to the processor that uh, wait, it wakes it up out of its sleep state and has it start executing code. Um, so timers are things that you want to avoid on a laptop. Uh, with the data engine, uh, you have your, you, we have only one timer for the entire Plasma desktop to fire it. Once every second or every half second, depending on what widgets it requests. And that goes out and gets all the data all at once. So you only have one timer running at a time to save power to your laptop. Now, dashboard, I mentioned that is, we have, it's pretty much the same thing as on a Mac, if you haven't seen it. It brings your desktop forward in front of all your applications and you get to see the widgets on your desktop. It's convenient uh, with those things, like if you want to see the weather, but just hit that one keystroke and then all your widgets can go and you see the weather. Right? You see uh, desktop Zoom, desktop Zoom is uh, in a very rough state right now. You're not really going to want to play with it. But the idea is that uh, we're going to have many layers of Zoom to your desktop. So you might have one where you see all your widgets out front and full view, but then you might want to zoom back and just have a whole field of widgets. Just hundreds of them all and you only want to look at a few, so you zoom in on that part, you zoom out to see the whole field, and you zoom in again on the other part of the field that you want to look at. You could have a whole, a, another folder showing, you could organize your work in that way, have different windows open, but uh, <coughs> you just zoom out and see everything, zoom in to get the nitty gritty. Uh, and this is implemented not just using, uh, we don't zoom in like, with just taking advantage of the vector, the vector images, we zoom in by we zoom out by losing detail. And so instead of seeing that you have a giant field of desktops, you might just see just have one, two, three, four, and you choose that and you zoom in and you see inside of that. Now we still have the typical workspaces as on the regular Linux desktop. Um, I think, yeah, well, I guess the one other thing to mention here is uh, this tiger plasma. Uh, I'll show you towards the end. Uh, it's just an example of a simple plasma widget. And the great part about it is uh, it's not hard to make plasma. Plas plasmoids are our ADD name for widgets. Uh, plasmoids take, uh, at most, four lines of JavaScript. JavaScript being just one of the examples of the language that we can use. Uh, we support JavaScript, C, um, pretty much any, any language that you can think of. You can name right now. Plasma supports it. If it doesn't, you don't support it. Uh, you can add it to a uh, scripting language support, uh, which is across the entire desktop. Um, PS is a very cool tool. I don't know if any of you have used it or not. Uh, it doesn't get anywhere near the kind of press that it deserves. Um, Kiosk is a tool for sysadmins. We want to manage uh, many desktops, for instance, in a computer lab. Uh, you can run KDE and then run Kiosk to it. And Kiosk tool will come, come up with a set of rules for what it allows users to do. Uh, you can lock down the desktop. You can say, users can't open the console. Users can't uh, open up the menu. They can only open up a browser or there, there are many, many ways to lock it down in terms of desktop and all these sorts of things that sys administrators want to do for the graphical user environment is provided by Kiosk 2. And another thing Kiosk 2 will do is grab profiles from a remote server and update them uh, over the net. So, for administrators. uses the solid framework. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this. It, we had basic libraries working before, but uh, everything was running off of timers, which are, if they're not your enemy, they should be. Uh, so everything now just gets an event from the kernel. As soon as I plug in my MP3 player, as soon as I plug in my camera, 
the kernel knows immediately. It doesn't have to uh, do any uh, user space checking to that. The kernel just knows. And then it tells our listener, which is how, and then how will talk to solid. And just with that one event, we get notified immediately without using a single time loader. You plug in your USB card. And then uh, in the system tray, we have a little pop up that will tell you. Like in the new device, and it'll offer to let you open it in Dolphin. Athenati um, was another question. Um, this is for our PIM suite, uh, uh, personal information management suite. It's for mail, for contacts. Um, this we wanted a back end for that stuff, so that you could run a Kmail, Kmail for your mail, or you could use Thunderbird. Mm -hmm or any other mail phone. And they would all use the same backend. They wouldn't store your messages uh, in duplicate, wasting space. Uh, it's much easier for a simple, to, for you to write a simple application that checks your mail. So I could, with just a hundred, few hundred lines of code, I could write an application that sees that you have one new mail, or, and I could show you the first five messages, all from that same backend store, without having to go out onto the internet or anything. All just stored uh, locally uh, and shared. I mean, uh, by doing it, doing it in this way, we can make sure that every time an application wants to access a contact or access your mail, uh, it's using the most efficient backend possible. It's, sometimes it's just not feasible to worry about creating your own super fast backend when you write your application if you just want to store a few contacts. So now, you just tell Akinati that you have a new contact and it'll put it into your own relational database. Um, and oxygen, oxygen is our graphics punch. Oxygen, I love these guys. Um, these are the KDE artists. These, uh, most of them don't know any programming. So they were hard to get in touch with. Uh, KDE attracts developers. It doesn't really attract uh, any other kind of person. Every free software people know how to program as a rule. But we went out and we met uh, anyone who knew how to pick up a pen. And if they were good at it, uh, we invited them to join the Oxygen team. Um, it was spearheaded by uh, Kim Nero, is his name. Um, just one guy that he, he did a great job uh, unifying the team. Uh, so Oxygen itself, this. Say the amount of work he had to do. He had to create him. He and his team. They created over a thousand icons. And these icons all share the same look, same look and feel. Uh, it's not just creating an icon. You also have to think about things like: Did we use too much contrast? Is this going to look weird next to the other icon? Is it going to stand out? So you want all your icons to look the same. And he did that uh, with, with, with the oxygen group. Uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, those are just the techniques they to use, uh, they desaturate the colors and the icons, and they make it stare as well. Um, but it wasn't just the icons that they did. Uh, once they'd done that, they, we realized that the whole desktop had to be over, had to be over, uh, had to be done over. Uh, our windows just had frame after frame inside of frame and you would see lines everywhere that was what characterized KDE so we needed a new <coughs> theme uh, and this guy came up with it uh, it I'd say it looks similar to a Mac but it was his own inspiration I don't know really hmm. anything about where he got that from <laughs> uh, it looks very smooth very smooth and very very consistent it's it, it may take a little getting used to someone who hasn't used it, but once you do, uh, you just can't move over to anything. Uh, so <coughs> kind of mentioned uh, plasma, that you could create a plasma using JavaScript. Now that JavaScript, um, of course, none of the uh, KDE is actually done in JavaScript. We needed to have uh, some way of having JavaScript, having Ruby, having Python, some way of having all those scripting languages and other languages like Java talk to KDE applications. 
Um, so we, we created cross, which is uh, a, a simple way of doing that. If I wanted to add uh, support for JavaScript scripting to case this card, if I wanted to add Python support to Conqueror, all I have to do is add five or six lines of code. Uh, it's just this template that we can copy and uh, then your application is suddenly cross native. You can use these uh, these other languages. You just have to tell it you know, what entry points. We're using other languages. Um, move on to another feature of Qt, which is a toolkit. Uh, it's written. Written is obviously big now that everyone has multiple cores on laptops. So Qt just provided a simple framework for application developers to use multiple, multiple threads. Threading is a nightmare for anyone who has tried it. I mean, if I could ever show a hand with anyone who loves to write threaded code and loves to debug it especially, we have one guy who has got to be kidding, raising his hand right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> kudos to you. Uh, so, uh, 12 set tech just came out of the uh, Concurrent that lets you have thread pools, uh, um, which is just a better way of doing threads. You, instead of your application naively going out and saying, I can do this uh, with 100 threads at a time, do it for me, operating system. And the operating system says, Oh, 100 threads, so much for me to deal with. Uh, there must be a better way. And this is that better way. You just you tell the toolkit uh, that you want to create those 100 threads, the toolkit or your application can look at the at the processor, get its information from solid, it'll tell you it has two cores available, and then you'll only be running two threads at a time instead of those hundred. Uh, so you'll have much less overhead when using the thread pool. And of course, the great thing about Q is it's cross-platform. You can write your multi-threaded code uh, for Windows, for Mac, for Linux, all using the same um, you don't have to rewrite it or anything. You don't have to deal with key threads. Uh, oh no. this, I got into a great conversation with the guy at the PDE conference about Phono. Uh, Phono is a, another cross-platform thing for developers to make things simpler. It, I'm just going to be repeating this message over and over again because that's what KDE 4 really seems to be about. Um, Phonon is our layer in between uh, the application and ASA or Pulsar or uh, Zine or GStreamer, any of those lower layers. It, your application just has to say, I want to play this sound. You tell Phonon that it wants to play this sound. And Phonon will take care of all the details for you. Uh, anyone who's used Zine or Empire knows there's a whole lot to configure with that. And you just have to become an expert in those uh, just just in order to play a simple sound or start recording something. Uh, and just forget about writing cross-platform code if you're writing to Zine or Empire. It's been done, see VLC, but those guys are geniuses. Um, so phone can use any of these backends. Zine and Empire are the current ones, but uh, there are other ones coming out. There's going to be Helix, which is the real, uh, real media backend. That one will be coming. And uh, in, on Windows, there's Direct Show. On Apple, there's QuickTime. And uh, anyone else who wants to create their own can do it. It would be kind of funny to see uh, you know, your applications playing movies on an ASCII screen, uh, ASCII video player. We don't have um, So yeah, you just write your application once, and it's It'll play that sound on Windows, Mac, Unix, Linux, you name it. Uh, phone on is video and audio, which is recording and playback. Um, Apple Mac. Apple was a research project, uh, which is strength of the open source movement. Uh, this was a, the European Union uh, just had a research budget. And they wanted to, uh, one of our guys put in a grant for um, semantic search on the desktop. Uh, this is things like, if I download an email and it's from Craig, so, 
Um, and later, I absolutely forget uh, you know, everything, the subject, the body of that email. But I knew I got a really great message from Craig on October 2nd, and I want to search for it. So uh, Nepomuk will know uh, it, it will tag that email as coming, uh, coming from Craig, and you can use your desktop search to search for that now. Uh, it's the same thing like with, if I download a file off of um, ftp.redhat.com, uh, the desktop will know that it came from that site and we'll be able to track that. Um, so it, it, MetalMark is about providing the metadata for files so that you can search them faster. And a lot of this metadata is up in the uh, Nettlemark is the guy who acknowledges it's just a little bit of trivia that someone might like. Um, yeah, so this is a, <coughs> it's a framework that um, it's another quick addition to your, to your application. You can add a search box into it. So <coughs> it's a very simple code and just ask Nettlemark for it. Um, and it really is that easy. Uh, right now, Nettlemark uses the Stringy backend. Um, which is just a, an index there, but we can plug and play those. Um, and you could use a Beagle search engine as so a back end. On Windows, you could use whatever Microsoft uses for your search. Uh, and same with the Mac. Uh, so, yeah. And then another bit of trivia that research budget, there's no chop change. One and a half million euros going into that project. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out more, those are the people that contact. Uh, you may not get money, but you can certainly do research. <laughs> Solid is the hardware notification back Talked about it already, though, so we don't we can really brief through this slide. Uh, it was it was started by Amarok. The Amarok guys wanted to be able to handle an MP3 player getting plugged in. Uh, it's a notoriously difficult problem. With the whole range of MP3 players. So they figured we should put it into a service and let the desktop take care of it. Uh, so because of that, any program can tell from the computer is being protected. That's a goal. I hate to say that I haven't seen any results from this lately, but from what I hear, it's still in the work. This was uh, for our applications to keep track of uh, whether you're online or not. If you want to share that with your friends, think instant messenger that shared amongst all of your apps. That new stuff is fantastic for application developers. Uh, this really, it makes it so much easier to take advantage of the internet. With case discard, uh, we have these uh, custom worksheets that let you monitor, you know, someone might come up and say, I like knowing that my battery is at this percent. It shows the graph here instead of here. And just they customize it to their hearts and death. But then it's hard to share that with other people. With Get Hot New Stuff, uh, our application can just use this framework that's already existing. It sounds familiar, right? And uh, automatically, the program will handle going out to the internet, downloading uh, custom widgets, custom, custom anything and uh, bring it to your desktop. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, another example of that is case stars where they go out and get um, planetary data from NASA and from all these, these other big groups that uh, it's data that we just don't have the rights to distribute, but we can tell them to go on and it. And of course, it's a free desktop that will extend it, so no one can use this too if they wanted to. Uh, and uh, the free the server and client are both open. Create a window. Sonnet. Sonnet was very much appreciated by our translators. Sonnet is a spell check and grammar check for your documents used by any program, uh, and it also detects the language that you're using. So you might write a paragraph in English, and then write a paragraph in German. And you don't want you to write a program that figures out which paragraph is English, which is German, and then does the spell checking on top of it. On top of that, if you just test your data to Sonic, Sonic will tell you, it'll automatically figure out the language, and then it'll, then it'll do the spell check, and it'll tell the program which words were spelled incorrectly. The grammar check is coming in the future, but the spell check is working. Already. 
this that's a skip. I can show you that in my own. We have no idea. This is a great video. Okay, runners. The run dialogue. For KDE. Uh, it uses the Nepomuk search. So if you have if there's some application that you want to run, instead of looking it up under uh, the KDE menu, system, accessories, uh, use, you know, any having to go through that whole menu, just type the first couple letters, hit enter, and odds are your program just ran. Uh, the search is instant, and <coughs> anyone can create their own backends to this. Uh, it doesn't have to just search the menu, it can search. Uh, the mail client might make it available to search through your mail from this one run dial, and then just uh, open your that email from Craig on October 2nd, just straight from the run dial. Uh, some of the other the custom features that are already implemented right now are things like the calculator. You can type equals 2 plus 3 and know that that is 5 without having to count on your fingers or anything like that. It's just it's at your fingertips. It's a keystroke away and just type in whatever you're looking for. It'll have it for you in under the search Okay, thank you. Anything was, uh, thanks to our new toolkit, Thanks to a lot of our graphical changes, um, everything is now done with OpenGL. So we get a lot of our rendering done cheaply by the GPU. Uh, so we can render uh, whatever kind of effects you want with no effort at all. Uh, so we took that to the next level. Right? Every part of the desktop um, will benefit from these little things. If you're moving a toolbar around, uh, on Windows you would get like a funky rectangular box that would kind of show you where it would go. With Q4 and KDE4, as you're moving that toolbar around, you'll see the application will slide away and that toolkit drop in there where it would be displayed. Or, uh, uh, what are the other examples? There's in our text input box, there's a clear button you can click to clear the text, and then as you click that, it fades away gracefully instead of just popping out of view. Um, there's a whole lot of these little, little, little effects that most people wouldn't notice, but they, they make things easier to follow. Um, instead of just things appearing into view, you see them transition. If you click on a, a window icon on the taskbar, the, your application will scroll up and appear, and then show up where it finally is. Mm -hmm. Shrink it and you'll see it shrink down into the taskbar in the previous slide. Kind of neat effect. So, anyone who's used KDE in the past is familiar with Conquer. Conquer was our uh, end the kitchen sink application. It did everything. But that, that's way too complicated for most users. If you want to manage files, you don't want to get your web browser, you don't want your web browser getting in the way of your file management. It was just crazy and confusing. There were 30 icons on Conqueror to deal with. 30 and more, depending on the configuration. And new users would just <laughs> throw up their hands and walk away back to GNOME or <coughs> back to Windows. Uh, so Dolphin was created for just file management. It's a much simpler interface. Uh, uh, the actual file management itself is still done by the same K part that Conqueror used. So it's a familiar interface for those who are familiar with Conqueror. The code is shared between the two. We've just made it a simpler interface for the file browsing. Uh, and then on top of that, we integrated things like Nepomuk and metadata. You can click on a file and say, uh, I love this file. Give it a five star rating, give it a three star rating, and then only show the files with four star rating and above. Um, these kind of things. You can add your own metadata if you want and you can search that using Nepomuk. And then just from the run dialog, search for your metadata. So I kind of mentioned this. Uh, we had a lot of code. We had four to five million lines of code, all written against the cute troll, uh, the cute toolkit. And then someone said, why don't we get it to run on Windows? Uh, you know, we just left. It's impossible. It's way too much code. 
the troll tech guys who make the cute troll, the cute toolkit, uh, just came around and said, hey, we ordered our toolkit. How about you guys do uh, KV? So after that, it wasn't a nothing matter. We spent years developing and uh, moved it over to Windows, Mac, and Linux. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, the traditional way to run applications on Windows so far has been to run them under Sigma, which is a Unix environment for Windows. It's hard to play with for a novice user. Uh, it's a little slower. Everything uh, is somewhat emulated. It's not your native desktop. Uh, you still have to run that X server. Uh, with this move, with uh, Qt's move over to uh, cross-platform ability, um, we were able to integrate natively with the desktop. On a Mac, running X11 programs was notoriously ugly. We'd get just the giant X icon for the program. Everything would have to run under an X server, uh, which was kind of separate. But now those applications get to integrate with the desktop. They have their icons in the system tray. They have their launchers in the start menu and whatever it is on Mac. And uh, the same with Linux. Uh, and none of this is emulated. You don't need to run an X server on Windows. It just writes right to your graphics card like any other Windows program. Um, actually, right on the Windows side of Windows uh, how actually how deep now is um, you know like the integration with Windows? Um, are you actually going to go down like to bring a full environment, like a full KD environment, mm -hmm. like a Windows with a uh, total shell replacement of sorts? Or Good like question. Um, we had to separate some things out. Some things were just too dependent on Linux. Uh, those uh, those programs won't be ported. Cases Guard is one of them. Uh, it's just to integrate with the Linux desktop. But things like KWrite with even Dolphin. Dolphin will run on Windows. You can run KSTARS, the uh, KDE education programs. Um, KWrite is a great editor, so it does it's a boon to me to be able to run on Windows. But uh, things like maybe say, um, well, I know Kaker's been replaced with uh, something new, correct? That's right. But can we say, like, uh, take a stock and run on Windows and maybe put in something like Kaker replaces it? Or is that too much? That Plasma isn't being good. Plasma is what provides that menu. No, it's not. Uh, maybe sometime in the future. I mean, it, it could happen, but right now that's not where we're spending our time. Uh, it's, it's nicer to get things like KOffice ported over, which runs on Windows, which um, that's part of our plan to take over the computer desktop. We'll get to it. Uh, Build system. This is just for developers. I doubt anyone's interested, but I liked it a lot. CMake replaced Auto Tool Hell, as they call it. Uh, Auto Tools is uh, just disgusting. Forgetting your programs compiled. Some people know it, and they're really smart, uh, but I don't know it. And CMake, I learned in just a couple hours. It was easy to get our program ported over. Uh, you have a, a to change the configuration settings for your compilation. There's a program that you can run and just set these flags uh, with the text user interface uh, instead of having to write switches to the configure program. Uh, everything is just done behind the scenes. Uh, some of the redundancy has gotten rid of, so the configure runs faster. It doesn't run people uh, with checks. Uh, it's just not right. So yeah, I mentioned our vision for taking over the desktop. This was part of getting everything ported over to Windows and Mac. We'll uh, we'll see our applications over there, which is great, because things like KMail or KOrganizer are Pim Suite and the Office Suite. If we have people writing uh, up their documents using those programs, it'll all be in an open format, and then you can move over to Linux with no hesitation, no worries or anything. Um, and this, uh, th that especially goes for um, contacts or the groupware suite of KDE. Uh, it's like an Office replacement. Um, Office is where Microsoft has their, oh, sorry, Outlook. Outlook is where Microsoft has their big lock on the desktop right now. Because with the corporate desktop, uh, everyone runs Outlook, and they all talk to an exchange server. If you want to run something else, if you want to try out contact, if you want to try something from Apple, you're gonna have, that program is going to have to be written against Exchange Server, which is no part of the 
Microsoft doesn't want anyone uh, operating with their programs at all. Uh, with contact with the KDE program, it's, it's the exact opposite situation. And hopefully we'll see freedom brought to the desktop. Uh, it, it's just a win-win for everything, everyone. Uh, once you switch over to an open exchange server, uh, equivalent, then you can use any program on the desktop that you want. You can run Outlook, that's fine. You can, but you can also run Contact, you know, any other program. Or vice versa, once you get the KDE client tools running, then you don't need Exchange. Uh, it works in both ways. Uh, so yeah, that's a push for taking over I mentioned how we switched over to SVGs for a while. But we're not completely there. Our theme still is resolution dependent, and the toolkit is to an extent, uh, but that's all going away pretty soon. Cube's going to release uh, version 4.5, which will have resolution independent. So you can have the same program on your phone that you have on your giant projector, or your HDTV. Uh, you can run solitaire, and you can see the cards, and uh, yeah. <coughs> Marvel is another attempt to bring freedom to all you guys. So nice to guys. Marvel is a 3D globe. Uh, it can be used by any application. It's cross-platform. <coughs> I shouldn't have to say that by now, but uh, we had applications that wanted to say what time zone you're in, what city you live, and we getting that stuff to work is. Just difficult. It's all locked down in proprietary networks. I mean, your application could open a browser to Google Maps at a certain address, but then have you work with that data on your end? So we needed something that ever, it was just open, so everyone could share data, and that was what Marble was. Marble uh, provided the streets, provides a satellite look at the world. For that, you can download uh, views from NASA. Of, you can look at the world through a thermal imaging cam, you can look at the moon. Uh, it does a lot of great things for it to simplify things for your application. <coughs> so with OpenStreetMaps, that's the alternative to all those mapping, uh, MapQuest, Maps.Google, those applications. Uh, it's an open street data. Uh, it's a separate project from KDE, but we use it with Marty. So I figured I'd mention it. Um, it's really amazing that this has taken off. Like, you figure the number of people that would be dedicated enough to creating a map of all the streets in the neighborhood. That's not even me. I'm a big free software guy, you know. But there are people who just all it takes now is a GPS in your, in your car. You just drive down the street and save that route, wrap data at the end, and then upload it to OpenStreetMap, and they can use it. So we've had a large percentage of the world mapped out. You know, anywhere here in New York City is completely done. Uh, yeah. <coughs> that, yeah, that is funny, but uh, one thing that we have on our side is that a lot of governments have, have street data that they've taken from their <coughs> citizens. And this is public data, it's not owned by private companies, just no one has bothered to bring it all together into one unified map and make it open for everyone to use. So we have the U.S. government who has their census maps of the, U of the United States. They don't know where to send their census takers. Uh, other countries like the Netherlands, they've already donated their map data to OpenStreetMap. And I mentioned India too, but you look at the world, a lot of it's covered. It's, it's just something I never thought would take off. And just, so we're, we're using that in the desktop. I'll right, show you that later. Uh, so 4.0 is a big transition. I gotta give it back. Uh, it, you know, it's not stable for everyone to use now. All of the features that you like may not be there yet. Uh, we're working on, on it, but in the meantime, uh, we have this great desktop that has features that you may like. You may just not like the mail application. Maybe it's not done yet. Maybe you don't like the test part. All these things are interchangeable with the old version. So if you're running KDE 3.5, you can open up KDE 4's KWrite and get the new syntax highlight and you can uh, or the find and replace uh, option. You can do the opposite. You can run a KDE 4 desktop and run KDE 3.5 application. 
if you want. It's just completely interchangeable. So there's no reason not to try it out. Parasiting. I mentioned a little bit of this. This was the wake ups. You want to avoid them? And things that we've done to get rid of them. One thing I didn't mention was the uh, Qt provided a new animation framework, a uh, Qt timeline. So if you want to do an effect, you're going to, and it's going to take a certain amount of time. And you may show 20 frames, you may show 10 frames, but you don't know how fast the hardware is. You don't know whether it's running over a network. You don't, uh, you're also not coordinating your efforts with other applications. So Qt provides one uh, timeline that your application can start up. You can tell it how many steps you need to do, and if it doesn't have time to do those, hey, it takes care of that. We'll put only in frames 3, 10, 15, or, or whatever. If you have great hardware, it'll show you all the frames. But either way, you get the same effect uh, done, and you don't have to program in all this hardware detection. Uh, another feature of this is that since it's provided by the toolkit, all your animations are done using the same timer. So you have fewer wake ups. So if you have two applications doing a just some sort of animation, which happens all the time, you, you'll have applications that just leave an animation on, they're all done for the same timer, and your computer will only wake up at one point and run those 30 tests all at once, and then go to sleep for the next couple of seconds. So you save battery there. Um, and then, of course, you can manually tell it that you don't want animations at all. It's a KDE option. You turn that on, nothing's animated. You just see the start and end, but it's great for being, when it's being run over in the network or with the program. So. KDE Edgy. This was, uh, these are the first people to really get ported over to Q4. And they really showed what the toolkit was capable of. I gotta show you some of these programs later. They're just beautiful examples of what's capable with the new graphics, with the new sound, with uh, the new solid back end, the new, with all these new frameworks, they just, they highlighted what is, what is new. Uh, they're great for educators and uh, that's, we've seen some deployment of KDE in that area. Uh, we've seen high schools pick up things like K-Stars to show their students what the sky looks like at night. Um, there's programs for learning other languages. Um, it used to be K word quiz, but it just changed its name. You have to get back to the United Probably, oh, yeah. Um, which helped me learn German. Uh, and Google PC. So these programs are really helping us get free desktops onto the labs and computers in uh, schools everywhere. Uh, and of course, since it's a free desktop, these schools can save money. Um, so K Stars, I'll, I'll show you guys use it later. It's for the uh, cosmology nerds in here. But it, it's some cool stuff. You can skip forward by day and look from a different point of view. And you can see that the sun, uh, over the course of the year, the sun will get to a higher point in the sky at noon as the seasons change. So the moons of Jupiter, it's great to be able to zoom in to all these astronomical things and see what's going on. You can zoom into Jupiter and you see the different, moon, different moons over here. Any other planet moons, you can see that. Uh, so these are, yes? Yeah. So he used K-stars, he opened it up, he saw Jupiter, <laughs> these moons orbiting around something other than the Earth. <laughs> okay. So that, that was how Galileo uh, realized that the reality is the heliocentric universe. Yeah, so if you want some more information about KDE, uh, of course there's KDE.org. I didn't even bother to explain that. Uh, this is where, you, if you want the real KDE news, it's posted to .kde.org. And there's the developer blogs too if you're interested in the nitty gritty of the phone and KDE and the premium from the interactive blog. I think we're getting close to the end. Oh, I'm not This is just. 4.0 is that, and then 4.0 is that. 
that this is really better. Uh, and we haven't abandoned the old uh, 3.5. We're still putting releases out. As long as it's just another great thing with free source. Uh, so long as there are people using it and there's developers on that platform, uh, there's still developers for 3.5, there's still users for 3.5, it's still being developed. Um, most of the work is being done in uh, KDE 4 now, but uh, for those people who don't are afraid of transition, uh, you have to develop it to help you out. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, four point one is our trunk right now, and then we have a stable branch for four, and we have a stable branch for three point. We're also in the developers are putting their patches to all the different platforms. Just things like platforms you will never see in the three point series. And just be a nice um, And we only want to go through that one. Uh, so after that, uh, we're finally back to our stable release schedule. You'll see, um, instead of waiting two and a half years for an update from us, you'll see them every nine months or every six months. And there we have it. Um, I have a KDE 4 desktop running here. I'd be glad to show you some applications and yeah. the next time if you have any questions. Yeah. All right. This may take a second to set up. <coughs> I can't bring the full back to you, but I can show you. Numbers here are not human readable. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of work on it. We had all their sensors listed on the left here uh, when really people were just using this program for the process. Here. And even in here, you can see the process ID, the kind of process ID is easier. And if I didn't tell you those, what those acronyms stood for, I'm sure there's a few of you that wouldn't know that VMR is that uh, any of you. So we simplified the interface. Can you bring it to the new one? You can see the new theme here. This is, uh, you still have all the sensors that are coming out. They're available. We just decided to hide them a little deeper so they weren't staring in the face. Uh, but the look and feel of this, this is all the new oxygen look that's this roll on the smooth curves to add stuff to the new oxygen. Uh, and you did things like 
memory. Now you can, you can read 29 megabytes, right? It, that's not something times tens of a tens. Uh, what do you mean readable? Well, some of the, the, the shared memory, the S of shared memory. The shared memory. Yeah. Yeah. Just, oh. yeah. uh, and then we have tool tips explaining some of the details here if you want to go into that for uh, But it's easy to you can select a whole bunch of processes and then fill them all at once. Or you can search for a, a, what you're looking to kill and what you're looking You can send them signals. Uh, we read it in the Greenex style. So it has more features, but I think it works a little bit. I mean, this is a very small screen. Yeah, you can't read it by number? You can still read it by number. Um, like I couldn't search for the PID. Um, uh, we added the IO schedule. Which if you have an IO intensive program, you know, sometimes you just don't want it to use a use your hard drive, so you don't crash so much. You schedule it with the idle schedule and it'll still get the CPU when you need it. So it's just easier to read and that of course here we get into some of the real graphics. This this is all uh Bezier curves which uh, just look pretty. They're smoothed out instead of the jagged bonds that you saw in the PD35 version. There's a little more information here. In this chart, um, there's four lines. We have nice uh, user system and then IO. Um, I, IO we didn't show before just because we didn't have it available to us, but it's a new feature of the kernel. Um, so now, I could show you an example. If I start a compile here, I do I think um, uh, uh, right. Right. this should see everything jump up. Okay. So we saw IO jump up. This first part is uh, looking through all the files to see what's changed. So it's heavily disk intensive, but it's not using the actual processor so much. Um, as you can see there's very little user in the system usage. But with the old version, you wouldn't see anything at all. The line would be almost the same as it was before. You'd have no idea that something was using your system heavily. Uh, and then another improvement was that we made uh, anything that's nice in using the processor is transparent. Because that's just not really using your processor. If you want to go out and start another application right now, I really do have 15%. I'm really only using 15%. This whole nice application will just go away and go <coughs> uh, And we did the same thing with the uh, this the memory usage, this RAM usage. Uh, we, we still show the buffers and cache, but we show them transparently just because if I start an application and it needs one and a half gigs of RAM, it, my system is going to have no trouble providing it, even though some of it was used in buffers and cache right now, because those buffers and cache will just disappear. So the user, it's much easier to see this. Thing. And that was only possible with the change in the toolkit, with the new uh, graphics infrastructure. So here we go back to the old center browser. You can see everything's still there. All you have to do is you have to start a new worksheet, and then you get it. You can create your own custom one. Uh, yeah. On the CPU mode, how do you handle multi-core? Multi-core. Oh. I'll show you. And you had the previous image. Yep. Uh, one of the new things is we know how many cores are. So we know that my laptop has two cores. Uh, like in this CPU load, like, does it have separate brass or is it like it's mined or? Okay, by default, we didn't create that graph because um, for the user, they still, they have an entire core that's completely going and used it now. We could show that separately, but we figured it would say If I want to create that graph on my own, uh, I can go to CPU load. Uh, and then we have it broken down by CPU, or you can show the entire system. And then I say user will appear to graph. And this is the system. So there's just my CPU one in CPU. And, and uh, that, that's one of the things that's coming up is we're going to integrate the take, uh, the get hot new stuff. 
uh, functionality to case this card, where uh, we'll have a menu icon, you go to it, you click on it, you say get stuff from the internet, and you can download a new worksheet that has your CPU usage for each core listed separately. So you can go out and download one that has, in this box, CPU 1, CPU 2, like that. And you don't have to create it on your own like I just did. Okay, so that was the application that I did in one second, but there's a lot of others out there. So the best one to show uh, is always from the edgy programs. They're just, just the end it was fun to see this program running on Windows. It uses OpenGL and does all this 3D rendering. It was supported with no effort at all, as far as I know. I think it just came over. Anyway, this is the uh, Hey Get Me Stuff to Take Care of. You say download the data. And there's all this available to you. Minor, minor, finally, or the data. And people complain about KDE like being bloated as it is. It's good that we don't have to include this stuff. Uh, so you just choose one of these and you say install. And we'll grab it. And it's installed. Now I can come install it with another code. What was that? Yeah. Oh. Oh. I'm more worried about the uh, Atlantic flight has to be built. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the get new stuff, you have like one like central repository, and each application you have like a repository. That's up to the developer. The client and server code is released as part of uh, the get hot new stuff infrastructure. It's a free desktop with our standard, any program can use it. Uh, when you when you set up your program, you just tell it what's going to work. Okay, so like in this program, that list of stuff, where is it coming from? That, uh, that KDE, list, how is that list populated? On our KDE servers, we have a list of all the uh, extra metadata for case stuff. But that server could be anywhere. And okay. You could write a program and have your server query to okay. uh, Yeah, There's a way to lock onto a... No, it's geo something. Okay. Yeah. And another thing that's great about case stars is uh, this is used by a lot of astronomers. This, uh, it's surprising how many scientists use KDE just because of case stars. You can plug in your telescope, you can plug in your uh, Oh, they have cameras that track the sky. You can plug that into your computer and have it controlled by KD, have it controlled by case system. Hey, stars. <coughs> so it'll track the moon, it'll track that particular star or whatever. Uh, all from the computer. Okay. Where's some point we'll see the planet. Uh, it's pretty far away from where it's occurred. You just click on the planet itself and then the... Uh, maybe there's... Oh, maybe I have to download the uh, picture data. For a lot of these planets and for a lot of the nebulae and constellations or uh, uh, other planets, there'll be a picture provided that when you zoom in, you can see the planet close up. Uh, sorry, I don't have it. Anyway. So are any of these plugins get how to stuff? Are they all uh, dependent on server lists or is there like a peer-to-peer -peer component that will allow you to sort of get it out in the world? Right now it is just client server. But if you set up your client uh, in a very open 
when you can have people upload their stuff to your FTP, for example, and then uh, to get any hot new stuff served in the service. Uh, are there any plans to make the SIS well, if I could, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the display here, but you can see on my laptop, that right now I have two things, and they're both completely different. They're just, it's a widget just like anything else. Uh, the one on the left is the standard one that comes with KDE 4. It has the integrated search and your favorite programs. You can also have the old KDE show too. Uh, yep. uh, I mean, the Oh, the, the, that was called Ticker okay. in the old KDE um, Yes, you can open that too. Oh, it works at the end of the I have to take my word on that. Uh, so the menu itself and the bottom bar, those are just widgets just like anything else. You can create your own using JavaScript. And with just a few lines, you could have your own desktop file. You have your own game. I don't know if it works, but could you show us the user preferences application? Sure, that's a new one. Um, we moved over from K control to something called system seven. Connected to the output. Yeah. I just have to move it up. Okay. This is our, our new looking field. I think that they borrowed it from Kubanti. Uh, Kubanti just have done a little work. So now, this is using the same K part from Dolphin, actually. This is just a list of files uh, organized into groups for the user for this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyway, the new stuff is here under desktop. This is the desktop effect. This will use compositing so you can have things like true transparency. And um, this is where a lot of the features that have shown on YouTube are from. Um, let's see if I can get a good one. Okay, so now what you can see from this is the active window is much brighter than the background window. Um, as soon as we move over. So you can just, it helps with uh, keeping yourself focused. Uh, the, the, one back and that one. Yeah. the one you're on right now is actually your, it's the active window even though it's behind the other one? Yeah, uh, that's a function you can turn on in KDE. You can have the okay. focus follow the mouse. It's not on by default, but I like it. Uh, by default, you have to click to, to be like that. And that program will just be in the background. But can you raise the window without a click? Can I raise it without a click? <coughs> you can. That is another option. Uh, focus all the way. That's why right now. Click the focus is the traditional one that you're familiar with from Windows. And, uh, uh, okay. and then auto raise. This is such a tiny screen. Yeah, I'm going to click on the one this one? Yeah. Okay. It's a good question. It's a unique number for the game you're playing. So if someone else uh, opens up that same game, the cards the card game. It tells me that they're from the I don't know. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, so, yeah. One thing that's nice about this new version, uh, when I move the cards around, it'll tell me if the game is still running. If it's trying to get the penalty going. 
Yeah, it's a mecha move in English. There, the game can still be one. The game can still be one. So you know that you're not shooting in the dark. You're not, you know, something to work for. Test the fun, no. Test the frustration, I will give you that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we didn't do that with this. You mentioned the screen resolution. Is but there a minimum recommended screen resolution for KDE now? Well, we're not resolution independent yet. Uh, what we did try to do was we made uh, as many dialogues as possible openable under a uh, 640 by 480. I think that's right. Either that or 800 by 600. Any, some small resolution. Uh, we used to have dialogues that were just huge. Uh, so that's part of getting things down. Once we get true resolu resolution independence from the toolkit, then we'll be able to say any resolution. Do you have any time frame for that? Uh, that's dependent on the release 4.5 of the toolkit. Yeah. Uh, but I can show you some resolution independence here. I mean, already this is a very tiny screen. If you showed this on my desktop computer, it would just it would be this big. And I won't be able to play. Yeah, so I can... I well, the, it needs a certain size at the bottom. Just I'm going to fill these cards in. But uh, if I shrink it down to like cell phone size, you know, we're already at maybe 175, 75. Uh, I noticed it was doing that on the card game, but not on this other display over here. All right. On the control panel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This dialogue is not resolution in the thing. But, uh, the games in the HU application were where we were testing our new stuff at. I think they showed up pretty well. Can you show the HU map? Uh, sure. Face towards the world. Uh, hey. Okay. This is another. Hey, hang on. This is, you know, for a younger audience. And you guys. I get so frustrated with this game. I'm completely <laughs> kidding right now. Uh, Okay. Yeah, this is not the game for you guys, apparently. I don't know how to play this game at all. There's something new about the configuration here. There's new tools here that I mentioned. We can also see it from this. Yeah, this This program wasn't ready for the four over release. I wasn't looking at it. Yeah. This wasn't ready. I used to do it myself. Maybe? This is not, this is changed. I mean, it looks like it's made. It's not changed at all. They're doing a lot of the work now. It's, it just wasn't ready. And the program itself, I like more than Tiffin, but the way it looks is kind of horrible. Yeah, yeah. That's the way. What about uh, what about uh, KChat? KChat? Mm -hmm. was another one. I didn't really get second thoughts, so I kind of uh, tossed up the chip and the fire box. Uh, you want to just to download a program name? <laughs> 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 Okay. There it is. I can show you some of the What's the diagram? That's the X. That'll be the close. No, no, not the X. The sap. That's the 
So we put a little space in here because that's the thing we saw. Right, right, right. Okay. As you mentioned, and you kind of mentioned that this whole thing is, even though know, it's a floral release, it's still kind of like data. It's, why do you guys think that it'll actually be like usable for non-technical? Uh, interesting question. Uh, I like to think of open source releases as part of a continuum. You can get uh, stable, so, uh, stable programs. They're just older. So right now, three five releases there. Or you could have you could use the four release if you wanted the a little more bleeding edge, or use the trump anywhere. Uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to answer this question. Um, so uh, distributions are the ones that will decide when everyone is moved over to KD4. Once it's stable, uh, distribution. Because I mean, like, yes, I installed KDE the other day, and it was really pretty and everything, but after about 20 minutes, but no. after about, you know, an error a minute for 20 minutes, I had to go back. Yeah, that, that's, that's all up to the distribution. The distributions are the ones that are the gatekeepers to this whole flood of uh, open source software. And we get the levels of... I heard, like, Ubuntu, for Hardy Aaron, they're looking for... Yes, yeah, they have it available separately. You can, if they have three, five, is their default desktop, then you can install the 4.0 packages. But Aura 9 is the big one. They're going to use uh, KDE 4 as the default desktop. Jonathan Reynolds said that KDE 4 is going to be the distributed version of Ubuntu. Yeah. 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 Yeah.